open blinded eyes, made lame walk again. soul from every sinful state. I am born again and I want to proclaim you are Lord and King of everything to give you praise. Why I sing your name. I'm born again. Yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And you deserve the highest praise you conquered and rose from the grave. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in God's house. Amen. Good to see each of you here. We're thankful for another opportunity to be in his house, aren't we? Amen. Let's stand together. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray for those that are unable to be with us. We've got several traveling, those working today. Let's remember them and let's remember those that are sick. And let's just call on the Lord together. We're, let's have church. Amen? Amen. Sunday school throughout the remainder of the service. Let's, let's worship him. Let's go to him together in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father. Lord, we're grateful, Jesus, for another opportunity to be in your house. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord. You've been so good to us, Lord. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. Have your way in this service, Lord. We call on your name, God. Oh, Jesus, hallelujah. Oh, we need you today in this house, Lord. We call on you, Lord. Hear our, our cries, Lord. Attend unto our prayers, Lord. Touch those that are sick, Lord. Those watching online, Lord Jesus. Touch those that are traveling, Lord. Give traveling grace and mercy. seated we'll keep continue to worship we'll ask our ushers to come receive our penny march and come back around and receive our sunday school offering let's worship the lord while they come around victory is mine victory is mine
Praise the Lord. Teachers, you can take charge of your classes. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Those in the adult class were kind of in transition. We didn't really finish lesson two, but we need to do lesson three. So I'm going to attempt to do some of both today. So if you want to be in 1 Kings 12, we'll be there for a bit, and then we'll move to 1 Kings 13. A little bit at a time. I feel a little scattered. You'll have to forgive me. Pray the Lord brings it all together somehow. <laughs> Ooh, feel out, feel a little all over the place. So, the Lord's help. Pray we all get something out of it. Okay. Last week, before we read any text or anything, we're just going to review just a minute. Last week, we learned about the dividing of the nation of Israel due to the idolatry and the rebellion of their third king, King Solomon. Y'all remember this, this dividing of God's chosen people, which put out of that nation of Israel that we just kind of think of as maybe kind of a rectangle. It's not exactly shaped like that, but it's elongated, which put the ten tribes of the north, um, divided them, and they're considered Israel now going forward. And then the, the bottom two tribes, which is Judah and, and Benjamin, put them together, and they're considered Judah. Israel and Judah, they came about at this division, came about, remember, after Solomon's death. It was because of his idolatry, but it was after his death that this took place. Last week, we also met the two new kings of these divided portions of Israel. We met Rehoboam, who was Solomon's son, who would reign over Judah, the smaller portion of Israel. He would reign over the bottom portion of Israel. Um, he was, of, Rehoboam was Solomon's son. And then we learned about Jeroboam, where we met Jeroboam, who was Solomon's servant, a man who had served under Solomon, who would reign over Israel, the top portion. The ten tribes at the top would be, would be uh, reigned over by Jeroboam and the bottom by Rehoboam. We ended our lesson last Sunday a little shy of what needed to be covered, so please allow me just a few minutes to tie it all up, hopefully. Remember that Rehoboam, upon, upon inheriting the throne from his father Solomon, was faced with a request by his people that he lighten their load. The yoke they bore under Solomon was both heavy and grievous, according to 1 Kings 12 and 4, and they just wanted some relief. Remember that? Rehoboam wanted three days to think their request over and to ask counsel concerning it, and that's exactly what he did. He sought out the counsel of the old men, and he sought out the counsel of those who were his peers, the young men. The old men said, give the people their requests, speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. The young men said, don't give them an easier time serving you, add to their yoke, and it, it, add to their yoke instead of taking away. The Bible says, Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the elders and chose to heed the advice of the young men and make the people's yoke heavier. He wouldn't chastise them with whips. The Bible says he would chastise them with scorpions. Sounds very painful, doesn't it? Rehoboam, who was heady on a power trip, after the announcement of his choice of giving them a heavier load, was not met with submission by God's people, but rather he was met with revolt. After they killed Adoram, if you read that, hopefully you did, a man sent by Rehoboam to collect their taxes, the ten northern tribes assembled as a congregation and they appointed Jeroboam their king. So they pushed Rehoboam aside because of his choices. Now these ten tribes have gathered together as a congregation, and they have now named Jeroboam their king. And after a brief attempt to assemble an army against them, Rehoboam had to ultimately lick his wounds and accept his place as king over the southern portion of Israel, the two tribes considered Judah. We know that ultimately all of this was set in order by God. According to the last verse of 1 Kings 12, you, look, you can look at it. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but 1 Kings chapter 12, the very last verse where it says, For this thing is from me. That's God speaking that. Quote from the Life and the Spirit Bibles it says, It was the Lord who brought about the division of his people. He designed the existence of two nations, one as a punishment for their idolatry, and two, as a means for preserving a faithful remnant, remnant through Judah. Because if they'd all stayed the same, would nobody have made it. So that division caused there to be a righteous remnant that held on through Judah. Though Israel as a whole departed from God, a remnant in Judah remained faithful to the covenant. And through them, God was able to fulfill his promises 
of a Davidic Messiah and redemption. All of this leads us to our next lesson, which is lesson number three. And before we read our scripture text, let us first look at what happens at the end of 1 Kings 12. Some of this is covered in your quarterly. I'm going to read a little bit from, from that. In my book, I assume it's the same as yours, it's titled Declaration. And this is talking about a little bit what happened in chapter 12. In the last part of chapter 12, we read of Jeroboam's quick spiritual demise. He had no sooner become king than his power and position became his biggest concern. He did not care whether or not he obeyed God and administrated and administered a godly reign in Israel. He immediately feared that if his people went to the temple in Jerusalem to worship God, that their loyalty to him would waver and their hearts would turn back to the original kingdom and the rulership of Rehoboam. Therefore, he asked counsel again of some around and expressed his fears. They advised him what great advice. He got great advice the first time. He's going to get some more here. They advised him to make two golden calves and place them in convenient places for the people to worship. He told the people that it was too much for them to have to go all the way to Jerusalem to worship. Remember, this is the ten tribes, and now Jerusalem is located in the southern part where it's now under the control or under the leadership of Rehoboam. So Jeroboam's saying, it's too much for you guys to have to go down to Jerusalem. Let's just fix all that. They could worship just as well in Bethel and Dan. So he set up a couple of different places for them to worship. One sin led to another, and soon Jeroboam had built a house of idol worship, idol worship and installed priests to order the rituals. He proclaimed a feast in Israel to coincide with the feast of true worship in Judah and offered sacrifices and incense on his idolatrous altar. Jeroboam told the people that it was too much for them to travel all the way to Jerusalem to worship God. Now, keep in mind, Bethel, I looked it up, Bethel, of course Dan is higher up, but Bethel was more in the southern part of that northern uh, kingdom there. It was only about ten and a half miles to Jerusalem from Bethel really wasn't that much farther but he convinced them that that was a better place to come of course we know that the shortcut he provided was an abomination to God today there are many who have offered spiritual shortcuts to those who are foolish enough to listen to them it is easy to find a preacher who will tell you that you don't have to repent and be saved in order to go to heaven you can do good day good deeds give money to a good call sign a membership book be baptized in water or shake a minister's hand. Others tell us that it is not necessary to live a separated life from the world and its fleshly pleasures. They tell us that it doesn't matter now how you dress or what you participate in, just so you have accepted Jesus or added Jesus, typically, is what you're just doing. If you follow these shortcuts and a thousand others we don't have space to name, you will find you have left the narrow road which leads to life and transferred to the broad road which leads to hell. Follow God's map, the Bible. It may seem like a longer trip, but it's well worth the effort, isn't it? Amen? Let me read you this scripture. Matthew 7 and 13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Uh, this is a quote also from the Life and Spirit Bible. I've added a few things to it. But Jeroboam once settled in the northern kingdom as their king, established a counterfeit religious system by offering the people worship of their gods through idols after the pattern of the golden calf made by Aaron in Exodus 32 and 8. Jeroboam then appointed priests which were not of the sons of Levi, thus ordaining men to the ministry who were not qualified according to God's law. Jeroboam's establishment of a false religious system produced two results. First, most people who remained in the northern kingdom accepted Baal worship along with its immoral practice of cult prostitution. Number two, the majority of the godly remnant that desired to remain loyal to God and his law, those that were in the northern kingdom that really had an inkling and wanted to serve the Lord, they suffered greatly as they had to leave their possessions, everything that they had, their, their inheritance, whatever they had there, they had to leave that and move to the southern kingdom in order to worship the Lord according to his original revelation and commandments. This early portion of Jeroboam's reign has him taking counsel yet again to the further demise of himself and all those who remained under his rulership. 
Following bad advice that gets you in a bad way typically leads to the following of more bad advice. Therefore, the furtherance of sin is inevitable. Isaiah 30 and 1 says, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. That's what Jeroboam is doing up here, and he's leading other people to do the same, adding sin to sin, taking counsel, but not of the Lord, and moving on in a downward spiral. In reading about Jeroboam's actions and choices, we can see that he had no fear of walking away from God. It's not mentioned one time about him being nervous about doing this. He just headlong. He had no fear over the fact that he was leading other people in a false way. He didn't have the slightest fear about his own soul or the souls of those whom he was so graciously given charge over. Just one chapter previous to this. Remember his meeting with uh, Ahijah there in the wilderness. We talked about that last week or there on that road they met together and Ahijah met with him and tore his garment in 12 pieces and gave him 10 pieces and said, you're going to be the ruler. And this was just one chapter over. And here we are now in such a sp sad, horrible spiritual state. He has no fear of the direction that he's going in. But what Jeroboam feared the most was what so many leaders in our pulpits fear today, and that is losing numbers. He didn't want his people and his ten tribes to go down to Jerusalem, mingle around with those of Judah and Benjamin, and then pledge allegiance to Rehoboam. Jeroboam's actions were also about self-preservation. He built those altars so the people wouldn't go anywhere else, he didn't build altars because he truly wanted to see his people prosper. I mean, they, he was building altars. It was totally for the wrong reason. He didn't want them to prosper in the Lord. He didn't build them because he wanted those in his kingdom to serve the Lord, but because he didn't want to die. 1 Kings 12 and 27 says, If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Jeroboam was all about Jeroboam. How many across the land serving the office of pastor or preacher have lost their fear of God and are consumed with the fear of losing numbers? How many are also consumed with self-preservation rather than self-sacrifice? Huge difference. How many are focused on number one? Instead of all those who sit under their leadership, the answer is too many. It is these types of ministries that the Word of God tells us to mark and to avoid. Romans 16, 17 through 18 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, this is Paul speaking, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Not only did Jeroboam make it easier for them to worship closer to home, but he also instituted new worship practices at his temples, intentionally making Israelite, Israelites, the ten tribes, worship different from those that were in Jerusalem, though claiming to worship the same God with the same worship traditions. The tribes that went along with Jeroboam's choices perhaps at first didn't see the big deal about having a temple closer to home, about not going specifically to Jerusalem to worship. Maybe they thought worshiping closer to home would be a good thing. Hey, it's going to be more convenient, right? But once the two golden calves were brought out and once the non-Levitical priests were ordained and new feasts were instituted, shouldn't they have run for the hills? Or better, or better say this, shouldn't they have run with all of their might to Jerusalem? Just seeing that, I can't imagine. Galatians 1, 6 through 9, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that, than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Jeroboam clearly had another gospel to share. And I can't help but marvel at how those people, how these people who grew up going to Solomon's temple, who may have attended its very dedication, 
who used to worship at Solomon's temple, where the sacrifices were made and where the incense burned, where the priests were sanctified and holy Levites, where the ordinances of God and his commands were carried out on a daily basis, would be so quickly, quickly swallowed up into a false religion system, a religious system, just down the road and just across a few calendar pages, here they are. But unfortunately, such things still happen today. A shallow experience in Jesus produces a wishy-washy, reed shaken in the wind heart that is easily tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. We see it all the time. Ephesians 4 and 14, that ye henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. They lie in wait to deceive. My goodness. Staying on our toes and on our knees, staying in his word, staying in his house are vital to our Christian walk and to our Christian survival. Living a separated life and being full of the Holy Ghost, these are the ingredients that will keep us from deception and false doctrine. Pastor has said it many times, when you bite into a bad apple, it doesn't take you 20 minutes to know it. You know it right away. And you know it right away because you have eaten plenty of good ones before. If you eat the good of the land, if you eat the right, cling to the right, live to the right, then the bad, when it is heard, read, or seen, will instantly cause a bad taste in your spirit. It's all happened to us before, right? Yeah. A bad taste in your spirit with and by the Holy Ghost who dwells within. Col Colossians 2, 6 through 10. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. Right. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of the principality and power, of all principality and power. There were many in Jeroboam's day who fell hook, line, and sinker for this new way of worship, this new way of sacrifice, because they had no roots in the truth. Don't let any of us in this room or watching online be caught in such a trap. From this point, all of this is said so that we can witness what happened to Jeroboam in 1 Kings 13. We're going to just read 1 through 5. I'm going to read the full thing. Um, I think in the quarterly, it just it skips a little bit, but I want to do it all. Hang on. Let's get to the right spot. First Kings 13, 1 through 5. Now this is after all of this has happened. Jeroboam set up these altars. He's leading those ten tribes away. And this is what's going to happen to him. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. He is at the place that he established <coughs> for the people to follow in a false way. He's in Bethel and he cried against the altar and the word of the Lord, this is the prophet, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born into the house of David, Josiah by name. This is 300 years before this happened. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burned upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God which had cried against the altar in Bethel that he put forth his hand from the altar saying, Lay hold on him. He was mad. He was angry. Get hold of this man and his hand, Rehoboam's, excuse me, Jeroboam's hand, and his hand which he put forth against the man dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. The altar also was rent and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Let me read you this too from your quarterly. While the ceremony was going on, a prophet of God showed up with a word from the Lord. Jeroboam was standing by the false altar when this man of God began declaring the word of the Lord against the altar. He declared that a boy would be born in the line of David named Josiah who would become the king. As king, he would destroy this idolatrous worship. He would offer the false priest upon their own altar and burn their bones there. 
He also declared that God was going to give a sign to prove the truth of this prophecy. The altar would be broken apart right before their eyes and the ashes would be poured out. Jeroboam was furious. There's no repentance in this man's heart. There's no, oh, my sinful ways. Let me turn back. There's none of that. He's furious at being caught in what he's doing. It's interesting how people become angry when God sends a message condemning their waywardness and sin. Jeroboam shouted to his royal guards to seize the prophet and lifted his hand toward the man. As soon as he stretched his hand toward the man of God, it withered and he could not pull it back. How scary it is that we would speak against a man of God. My goodness. While he stood there with his hand and arm paralyzed, the altar burst open and the ashes poured out just as the man of God had declared. Jeroboam realized that this man truly was sent from God and began to plead with him to restore his withered hand. He had no concern for his soul. He just wanted his hand to be right. <laughs> That's vanity right there. There's nothing, nothing within, him, within him still spiritually. After being afflicted by God, it's still about Jeroboam. It's not let me get my heart right. It's fix my hand. Oh, my goodness, my hand. Isn't that such a shame? We see it in so many people's lives. Um, find the place. Jeroboam realized that this man truly was sent from God, began to plead with him to restore his withered hand. The prophet cried out to God, and Jeroboam's hand was fully restored and healed. Kind of, kind of reminds you of Moses and Pharaoh, doesn't it? Um, every time Pharaoh, something would happen, he would cry out, and Moses would cry out to the Lord for him. It just reminded me of that. Here we have the entrance of an unnamed prophet of God sent by God to condemn Jeroboam's actions and the altar he was using in such an idolatrous way. God saw and God knew that Jeroboam was what Jeroboam was doing and he was letting Jeroboam know that he was what he what he was doing was not going to stand. A righteous future king uh, like I said, 300 years later, Josiah would destroy all of this rebellion and idolatry that Jeroboam sought after and created. This is fulfilled in 2 Kings 23, 15 through 20. I encourage you to read that. 2 Kings 23, 15 through 20. Read that when you get the time. Amazing fulfillment of this prophecy. Aren't you glad that though we are surrounded by idolatry and rebellion against God on so many levels, right so many levels not just in pulpits but in the world every everything around us that god sees it all he will not acquit the wicked that's what his word says he will judge sin and there will be a righteous king one day who will reign forevermore amen jesus christ will rule in righteousness and all wickedness and sin will be destroyed we don't have much time left but let's i don't know let me go ahead and throw this in because last week i didn't if you will, just can read the rest of this lesson and into the next. We'll de determine what we're going to do. It seemed like there's so much in each lesson that I can't get through it all. I don't know how y'all do it. I just, I just get stopped up in this, these certain paths, and I want to go on them. But anyway, keep reading this one and read the next one. But I did want to point out, of course, that this, this prophet that came when he spoke and he shared this with um, – Jeroboam, there's so much that happens to that prophet through the rest of this whole chapter that we almost kind of need to touch on that as well. Um, that he was a righteous man to begin with, and he tried to follow the Lord. He did what he was supposed to do. He spoke to Jeroboam. He refused to be taken to Jeroboam's house. If you read this, hopefully you read the lesson, read the, um, read the scriptures that go along with it. Let's just read this real quickly. This man who came to Jeroboam really was a man of God. He, look at his credentials. He Really did hear, he really did hear from God. God spoke directly to him. He declared fully the message God had given him. He did not uh, water it down or try to make it easier on the flesh. His declaration was confirmed by miraculous signs and wonders. It happened right then. His prayer for Jeroboam's hand was immediately answered by God and in the presence of the people. He steadfastly refused the refreshment and reward offered to him by Jeroboam in obedience to the word of the Lord. This was a man sent from God. He was a man who knew God's voice and exercised God's power. The point here is this. Real men and women of God can be deceived if they are not very careful. And that's what happens to him as we continue on in that chapter. That man of God that was so strong and so uh, used of the Lord in that moment is going to be deceived and thereby give his life by the end of this chapter. It's, it's a really tough uh, to read because it's kind of a shame 
You look at Jeroboam who continues on in his sin and he continues to live, continues to rebel against God, but the man of God, when he makes a wrong choice, his life is taken so quickly. We better take heed. Take heed. As we live for the Lord, we better stay tight with him, stay close to him, serve him with all that we have while there's time, be looking, watching, and waiting. I love each of you. I hope you got something out of this lesson. I feel like I was all over the place talking 300 miles a minute, but I hope you did get something out. Let's have church together. I love each of you, and let's go to heaven together. Praise the Lord. was feeling and the emptiness I tried so hard to hide though I laughed and said my life was fine without you I was covering up the secret tears I cried then one day Someone told me of your mercy And the love you showed on a hill called Calvary There you died and Purchased my redemption When you broke sin's power And set my spirit free I'm a man It's true, there have been days when I failed you. Lord, you know the many times I've gone astray. But I've learned your love is stronger than my weakness. And your ear is open every time I pray. No one else has ever cared. Other friends can never be as close to me. I'm not afraid to face the problems of tomorrow. Knowing you are everything. Welcome South Asheboro Church of God. So good to see you in God's house today. Good to have Brother uh, Benny's nephew, uh, Jacob Taylor, alias JT. Good to have him with us today. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. Thanks to all that came out yesterday for the youth service. I uh, thank Brother Benny, Brother Eddie, Sister Donna for the job they did. Uh, you know, we're investing in these youth when we do this. Right. Praise God. Uh, We'll have Brother Eddie come on up here. We're going to be uh, having him to lead us in prayer. We've got a lot to pray about. But, you know, we've got a great, mighty, big God. He knows everything that we're going through, and he cares about us. He cares what concerns us, concerns him. Right. Brother Eddie. Uh, 
Um, I want to start this morning off with a praise report. Uh, a few weeks ago, me and Donna was having car trouble. And, and I gave a praise report for the first one. And then another one of my vehicles had transmission problems. And I said, Lord, I can't. You know, a lot of, some people don't believe in, you know, I guess physical things that God, but my God can do anything. I don't care if it's a healing or if it's if it's financial, but you know we had we had this one in the shop for about three weeks, and I'm thinking the more it's in there, the worse it's going to be, you know. But my God's going to take care of it. I know He is, and uh, He called me the mechanic. And as soon as I hung up with him, I called Donna, and uh, I said, "Hey," and then kind of like I am right now, I'm trying to hold back the tears, you know. She's like. He did it again, didn't he? He did it again. I said, he sure did. Hallelujah. You know, he did it. And I just love him and praise him for it. Amen. Um, let's continue to remember uh, Brother Sister Ball and her family. Um, Brother James and Brother Dean, Sister Sarah and her family. Sister Sarah, Sister Angela. Uh, Brother Benny, Sister Chastity, uh, Charles Chisholm, Peggy Massey, uh, Sheila, uh, Sister Sheila's mother, Christine, and uh, her husband, Rick, and uh, Heather Tackett, Jimmy Hyler, James Green, and Josiah. They all need a healing in their bodies. Um, let's pray for uh, Lawson Ferguson and uh, Sister Sarah's children. Uh, they need salvation. And also let's remember um, Sister Ball's uh, daughter-in-law's mother passed away so let's remember that family that God will uh, comfort them um, let's remember uh, brother Dylan he, and uh, Branson and Andrea and little Oliver they're all uh, traveling that we pray that God will give them traveling grace uh, continue to pray for Nathan and Brianna and uh, sister Anna's best friend's daughter Chloe and uh, brother Sam he's having uh, back surgery on the 15th and uh, they all need prayer. And uh, let's continue to pray for uh, for Aaron, that God will move in his situation. And uh, remember the youth from our church, Haley, Harper, Aaron, Jalen, Selena, and Tyranny. And by uplifting the hands, uh, does anybody have a special request? Okay, let's uh, stand and go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, God, we love you today, Lord. We love you and thank you, God. And we just praise you for everything you do, God. Oh, we know you are the God of many powers, God, and heal and financially, Lord, spiritually, Lord. We just ask you, God, to this touch brother and sister ball today, God. And touch their uh, daughter and lost mother family, God. Just comfort them, Lord, in this, in this uh, time. Uh, God, we just ask you to touch brother Sam today, God. Just help him as he goes to have surgery on his back, God. Just be with him, Lord. Give him a quick recovery, God. Lord, we ask you to touch Sister Sheila's mother, Christine, God. Heal her body, Lord, and touch Rick tonight, God. Lord, we just ask you, Lord, to, to give him a healing, God, and show him how powerful you are, Lord, and, and above all, save his soul, God. We ask you just to come down and convict him, Lord, and save him tonight, God. Lord, we ask you to uh, touch Sister Angela tonight, God. Help her with her disease, Lord, Lord. Lord, we just, she just needs a great healing from you, Lord. God, touch Sister uh, Garen's brother James, God. Just give him a healing in his body, Lord. Touch our brother James, God. Heal him. Touch Brother Dean's back and his legs, God. And uh, touch Sister Chastity, Lord, with her bronchitis, God. Lord, we just ask you, God, to touch uh, Sister Darlene, Lord. Uh, and save her husband, uh, Lawson, God. Just uh, heal his body of his cancer today, Lord. And, uh, Lord, we just ask you, God, to touch Sister Sandra, Lord. Just heal her, God. Uh, we ask you to keep... Uh, Brother Branson and Sister Andrea, little Oliver, safe, Lord. Uh, give them traveling grace, God. And keep Brother Dylan safe, Lord, as he travels, Lord. Give him traveling grace, Lord. And Lord, we just ask you, God, any, any uh, touch uh, Brother Josiah this morning, God. Just touch his upset uh, stomach, God. Just help him today, Lord. Lord, we just love you and give you all the honor and the glory and praise for, Lord. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. I enjoyed that Sunday school lesson this morning. You know, the word is given to us for an example. You know, and we got to make sure we're not deceived. You know, and, uh, you know, Jeroboam, he was deceived. You know, he, 
he he went in the wrong way, you know, leading people into wrong worship. You know, we've got to make sure that we're uh, looking at the Word, abiding by the Word, and being obedient to the Word. Praise God. Let's continue to worship as the choir comes to this time of ministry and song.
shouting. Oh, what shouting? Hallelujah. When we make it to heaven, it's going to be singing and shouting. So if you're afraid of noises, you ain't going to feel comfortable there. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's continue to worship and give and get our ushers to come save our tithe and offering. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Brother Matthew, would you pray with us time of worship? Bless you, be faithfulness and giving. Had a couple of birthdays uh, Friday, Sister Sandra, and yesterday, Sister Shauna. So if y'all stand, we're going to stand and sing happy birthday to them. I had a wedding anniversary since last Sunday. Okay. Announcements. Uh, tomorrow night will be prayer uh, night at 7 o'clock. Come out uh, one of a time of prayer. Also pray for the pastor. He'll be preaching uh, at the Denton Church of God Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of this coming week. Pray for Brother Scott. He'll be preaching on Wednesday night. God will give him both, anoint both of these. Praise God. Also, uh, announcements. Uh, after church today, we need to change our filter in our pump house, so I need some men to stand around and help uh, pull off the roof of the pump house so we can change that filter. So if I can get a few men to stand around after church, we'd appreciate it. Uh, also, now it's time for our $5 drawing for children. Search me, O God. That should be all of our requests. Lord, search me, O God. The psalmist said in Psalms 139, 23, and 24, Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. You know, we, we have, the, have the Lord to search us. Psalms, uh, I mean, 1 Peter 4, chapter 4, verse 17, 18. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? Right. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Right. You know, we got to make sure, Lord, every day, search me. If there's any wicked way, burn it out. Burn out, I pray every night, Lord, if I, is there any wickedness or any dross in me, burn it out. I don't want it in me. Let's continue to worship Brother Baker comes leading uh, ministry. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, I like Brother Eddie's testimony about God can do anything and he can. I know all my life I've had different things and I go to him and it always works out. But uh, when I had this knee operated on, I thought, you know, as high as everything else is now, well, it was $43,000. But I only had to pay 250 of that. So that, I, I said then God can do anything. So 
I hope you're still standing on that solid rock. If you want to stand and, and help me sing this. Through my disappointment, strife and discontentment, I cast my every care on the Lord. No matter what obsession, pain or depression, I'm standing on the solid rock. I'm standing on the rock of ages. All the storms that rages, rich but not from Satan's wages. I'm standing on that solid rock. Even though he's gone now, but I don't feel alone now. With comfort came the spirit of the Lord. With his word to guide me, from temptation hide me. And I'm standing on the solid rock. I'm standing on the rock of ages. All the storms and rages, riches. I'm standing on that solid rock Now I'm pressing onward Each step leads me homeward I'm trusting in my Savior day by day Close is our relation Firm is its foundation And on that solid rock I'll stay I'm standing Solid rock. On that solid rock, I'll stay. Praise God. If we'll stand on that solid rock, we'll not fail. We've got to have that sure foundation, Jesus Christ. Praise God. This time we'll turn the service to our pastor, Brother Shelton. clap offering praise on this beautiful Sunday morning do you realize how blessed we are to be able to be in the house of God amen the Lord's been so good to us I appreciate your faithfulness to be in the house of the Lord if we didn't have faithfulness we wouldn't have a church is that right he said if we didn't have faithful people you couldn't have a church nobody be here so I appreciate your faithfulness on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights you come because you want to be in God's house, because you have a desire to be in God's house. Amen? I just appreciate the way that you love the Lord. It shows. It's more than just what you say. People say that all the time. I love the Lord, but it shows in our actions. Is that right? It shows up in how you live your life, your commitment to Christ. I've had people tell me how much they love the Lord, and then you know, then they, you see them out in the world and live like the devil. It's more than just saying, Lord, you have to be obedient to his word. If you obey his word, that means you love him. He said, if you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's the proof. That's the proof that you love God. You are obedient to his word. <clears throat> if you mess up, you get it right, you get up, you learn from that, and you keep on going forward. Amen. Don't go back and keep doing that again and again. You learn from that. That's how you gain experience. That's how you grow in Jesus Christ. Amen. We're glad to have my buddy. I met him yesterday, Jacob, and he's a friendly young man. He won't get, Brother Benny called me after the view service. I was over here working, and he said, I got somebody I want you to meet. I went up, and we met, and uh, he invited himself in, and we just went on a tour of the church. And had <laughs> He's just a nice, now he's 13 years old. And uh, he's a good young man. I love him. Give him another hand for being with us this morning. He's a smart fella. And uh, I just, I thoroughly enjoyed meeting him. He's so happy and so friendly. And, uh, you know, some of you could take lessons from that. He's happy and friendly. Christians ought to be happy and friendly people. 
We ought not to be grumpy and moody and mean and ill-spirited. We ought to be happy people. Happy is that people whose God is their Lord. And I went home and told Sister Shelton, I said, I met Jacob today. He's a nice, nice young man. Amen. Jacob, we're glad to have you with us today. Hope he'll come back, be able to come back and be with us again. If you have your Bibles this morning, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you missed the service on Wednesday night, you, Brother Zach preached his first message, <clears throat> and uh, he done a wonderful job. He was nervous, and I'm glad he was nervous. I was talking to a preacher friend yesterday, I believe it was, yeah, it was yesterday. And I said, any, any preacher that gets up to handle this and is not scared to death, and is not nervous. You need to sit down. You don't. You may not be nervous about getting up in front of people. You you can learn how to do that in time. But when it comes to handling this book, every man of God ought to be nervous and scared about handling this that you want to handle it the right way. I tell the Lord God, don't let me say anything more, anything less than what you want me to say. Don't let me exaggerate anything. Let me tell the truth and speak it the right way. By your word. Amen. We're going to give an account for how we handle this word. We'll give an account for how we live by it, but preachers are going to give an account by how we handle it and how we preach it. And uh, there's a lot of Jeroboams today. You better watch out. I said there's a lot of Jeroboams today saying it's too far to go to Jerusalem. Too much of a sacrifice to do that anymore. You better beware of the Jeroboams today. Amen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading verse 7. The Bible says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. <clears throat> Why do we get so surprised when we see what's taking place in this world? The Apostle Paul said it was working in his day. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now there's been a lot of speculation about what he's talking about here. Who is that he until he's taken out of the way? Well, I, I personally believe it's the Holy Ghost. I believe in the tribulation, the Holy Ghost is going to withdraw, going to step back. But I also believe it represents the church. The church is going to be taken out of the way. The church is going to be taken out of this world when that tribulation happens on this earth. Somebody said, well, I believe the church is going to go through the tribulation. Well, if you want to, you can stay around here. But I'm going with that trumpet sound. God said we're going to be saved from the wrath which is to come. He's talking about the tribulation there. We're going to be caught up out of this old world and we're going to be with Jesus while all hell is being unleashed upon this world. Can you say amen? amen? I want to go when the trumpet sounds. Father, thank you. We're so glad to be in your house this morning. I've already felt your touch. I know that you're here, Lord. And I pray over this congregation. I pray over every heart and soul. Lord, I've already prayed over them. I've already told you, you know who's going to be here. You know who's not going to be here, Lord. And you know what we need this morning. I ask you, God, that you'll help me for, next, for the next little while. Let me preach this word, God. I pray you'll anoint me. I pray, Lord, that that word will not return void. Let it find its place in hearts today. As we've already asked that there be strong conviction in this house today. Let blinded eyes be open. I'm talking about spiritually eyes, spiritual eyes that are blinded, God. Let them be open this morning. Let deaf ears be open today spiritually. And I pray that our hearts, that our heart will be softened and tender and receive the word of God and we'll be changed in this house. Touch those here. Touch those watching online, Lord. And as always, God, I can't do anything without you. I sure need your help standing here behind this sacred desk this morning. Lay your hand on us. Lay your hand on this congregation. Let there be a pull, a strong pull, a strong wooing from that pew to these altars today. And Father, we'll bless you and love you and honor you for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. Would you shake somebody's hand and tell them you're glad to see them in God's house this morning? Hallelujah to God. Praise the Lord. give you all a minute to get settled and we'll get going here. I want our focus to be on the Word of God this morning. This is what will save you. 
This is what will help you and keep you. This is what will get you to heaven. We sit in front of that TV and we don't even blink at times. And we go to church and we're distracted by all kinds of things. We don't pay attention to the Word of God. This is what will keep you when the world's on fire. This is what will keep you when sin's trying to, trying to come against you and tempt you. David said, I'll hide your word in my heart that I won't sin against you. This is what will keep you when you don't know how you're going to go any further. But the word of God will be, be steady in your life and keep you sure in Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? We look around this world today and we see everything that's transpiring. We see the moral decline in our nation. This is not something new. Our, our nation, is, as long as they've been going away from God, we have been morally declining. We have been spiritually declining. We see the war, war taking place in Israel right now. I'm going to tell you, if there's nothing else that causes your, your attention to be stirred, you better be stirred when you see what's taking place over there in the Middle East, and especially with that nation, Israel. We see a falling away from the faith. I, I, you know, I don't want to linger here, but I've watched people that I never believe, ever believe would compromise, have compromised, and are so blind to it, it don't matter what you tell them, they'll make an enemy out of you. We're living in a lukewarm church age. Is that right? Go to most of our modern-day Pentecostal churches. I'll stay in the Pentecostal ranks. That's what we are. Go to most of them, and you, you find altars that are dry, people that sit lifeless on pews, sermons that are cold and lifeless and dead and dry. And, and the Son of God, the Son of Man, is wounded in the house of his friends. We see the perversion of this day. There, there is no blushing today in this country. People don't blush anymore. It doesn't matter. They're, they don't hang their head in shame. They openly and outright sin and dare you to challenge them. But we see all these things, and I don't know why we as the church, uh, we, we, we look and we're surprised by what's taking place. How can these things be going on? Well, the Bible tells us that everything is happening just like God's Word said that it would. Everything that's taking place, God said, it's going to be this way. This thing is narrowing down. God is still in control. I've been praying for the nation of Israel. I pray for Israel every single day. And I tell the Lord, God, you're in control of all of this. You know exactly what's going on. You know more about it than I do, so I'm just going to put my trust in you. What we do know from all of this taking place uh, is that the church ought to look up. Rather than looking down, we ought to look up because the Lord is coming soon uh, and very soon. The church is soon uh, to leave this old world. Can you say praise the Lord? I want to preach to you this morning from this thought when the church uh, is taken away. When the church is taken away. Bible teaches us both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. They declare to us that Jesus Christ shall return soon. The Old Testament alone has more than 1,500 references uh, to the coming of Jesus Christ. While the New Testament contains 318 references uh, about the Lord coming again. We know that this is the blessed hope of the church. You know, sometimes the church, we live like we're going to be on this earth forever. But the church is not going to live here forever. The church is going to leave this old world. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. We're like Abraham. We're going to have church here today. We're like Abraham. We're looking for a city that has foundation, whose builder and maker is the Lord. We don't need to get settled in this life. We don't need to drive our stakes deep in this old world. The Bible tells us Jesus is coming soon. This is the hope as the bride of the Lord. We're looking for that rapture to take place. We're listening for the sound of a trumpet. We're listening from a shout from heaven. And then in the moment and the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed and we're going to forever be with the Lord. This is our hope. 
this is not your hope today. You need to make your way to these altars at the conclusion of this message and make that your hope before you leave this house. This is our hope. But we also realize, according to the Bible, that only a, a small segment of this world uh, is looking forward to this great event uh, with great anticipation. Again, this should not surprise us as the church. The Bible tells us it's going to be this way. Sister Shelton that taught that wonderful lesson this morning, and, and she made mention there of what Jesus said that Broad is that road that leads to destruction. Wide is that way, and many there be which go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Listen to me, friend. I don't mind, don't care where I get in. I might be at the front of the line or I might be at the back of the line. I just want to make sure I'm there. Can you say amen? I just want to make sure that I go there. I just want to make sure that I'm ready when that rapture takes place. We're approaching the end of the age uh, when mankind, lost mankind, uh, is going to come face to face with their maker. But yet they continue to live uh, as if they'll never give an account uh, unto him. Jesus again said it would be this way. He said in Luke 17, verses 26 through 30, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In those days, the Bible shows us they were living as though they were going to live forever. They were partaking of sin. They were participating in things that were not sinful things. Amen. But yet they lived as though they were going to live on this earth forever. They took no thought of the judgment that was coming upon them. But listen to me, friend. The Bible said they carried on. They ate. They married. They were given in marriage. They bought. They sold. They planted. They built as though they had plenty of time, as though they would always have another day uh, until it was too late. Uh, judgment fell upon them uh, and they all perished uh, in their sins. I'm just telling you here today uh, that we better shake ourselves again uh, and we better wake up. Uh, I said the church uh, better wake up. Uh, Jesus is going to come uh, and we're going to be leaving this world in the moment and the twinkling of an eye. Somebody raise your hands and give him praise today the Holy Ghost here. They paid no attention. They refused to listen to the warnings. And they perished in their sins. They were not looking and prepared for the judgment that was coming. So it is in this day. While the church is looking up, for the Bible said, Our redemption draweth nigh. This world is living like things are going to continue just the way that they are. This lost and dying world, they're not looking for the return of Jesus. They're not concerned about the judgment that's coming. You know, I, I try when I preach. I, I'm not up here trying to tickle anybody's ears. I'm not here trying to make you like me or be happy with me. I'd rather have you mad at me and hear the truth uh, than to go away saying what a nice man, what a, what a sweet message that was. Uh, I'm telling you, judgment's going to come, uh, not because I said it, uh, but because it is the Word of God. Uh, I want to cry and roar like a lion uh, from the pulpit. Uh, I want to cry loud and spare not uh, and say this to you. Amen. Those here, those watching online, uh, that if you're not ready for the rapture, uh, 
the next great event will be the rapture of the church and then the judgment of God is going to be poured out upon this world I don't want to be here for that you don't want to be here for that you need to get right with God and be ready when it comes again I'm trying to stir your heart with my word. I'm trying to open your eyes. I've called for you. I've knocked at your heart's door, but yet you continue to ignore me, saith the Lord. Again today, I'm calling you. I'm drawing you. I'm knocking and hoping that you will open your heart to me. Judgment will come, just as I say, saith the Lord. You must be ready for it, and today you can be. If you will respond to me and to my word and to my love, I will change your life. I will change your eternity, saith the Lord. Put your hands in honor of the Holy Ghost in this house. Come on, church. Thank him and praise him this morning. Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the Lord. Ah, bless your holy name. I will not receive your religious form, saith the Lord. I will not accept your religion. You must come to me and be born again. You must be washed by the blood of my son. Your heart must be changed for me to receive you, saith the Lord. Honor the Holy Ghost, saints. Stop your ears to the cry of this world and listen to me and my words, saith the Lord. It is my voice that you're hearing. It is my voice that's speaking to your heart right now. Come to me, saith the Lord. I will save you. I will redeem you. I will make a change in you that you cannot make in yourself, saith the Lord. Raise your hands and love him and thank him. Oh, my God, my God. My blessed Lord. My blessed Lord. My blessed Lord. Hallelujah. Everybody stand, please, all over this house. The Holy Ghost is here. My blessed Lord. Blessed Lord. There's some of you in this house need to be in these altars this morning. 
These altars are open. I've got a whole lot more to preach, but the Holy Ghost told me to stop because he wants to do something here in some hearts today. I want you to come. I want you to come. If you need to be in these altars, you know. You know whether you do or not. I want you to come right now. I want you to come. If you're not ready for that rapture, you need to be in these altars. If you're not ready for heaven, if you were to die today, you need to be in these altars. There's things that separate between you and your God. There's sin in your life. You need to be in these altars. If you're not faithful to God, you need to be in these altars. If you're not committed to the Lord, you need to be in these altars. If you don't love Him like you used to, you need to be in these altars today. Oh, my God. Hakata mamaha. Shatala mohutai. Don't stop your ears to me. and Don't close your eyes and look away from me. I'm standing before you. I've opened a door before you. Walk through that door today. Come to me, saith the Lord. Open your eyes to me and look upon me. Open your ears and hear my word. Open your heart and receive that word, saith the Lord. Today I will change your life. Today I will do a spiritual work in you. Saith the Lord. Hmm. Hallelujah. Somebody respond to him today. Somebody come on down to these odors. I appreciate these that are here. Anybody else you need to be in these odors? Come on now, hurry. While the waters are troubled, that lame man said, I have nobody to help me get in the waters. Well, we, we don't have that excuse here. We can make our way down here this morning. We can make sure that we're ready. Some of you need to come and rededicate your life to Jesus. Some of you need to come and recommit your ways to him. Some of you need to come and just fall in love with him again. He's not the first love of your life. This is the first commandment that we have no other gods before him. Woo! Shata mama hai. Uta shata mama Oh my God. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. These altars are open for everybody that can come to come. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah.